Maybe I should tell him about my fishing trip up the Amazon. <laughs> or maybe some of my Scottish jokes. I wanted you to tell the one about Oh, okay. This was a funny story. In 1952, uh, when Baba, when it came time for Baba to leave America, we took him to uh, the airport, now known as Kennedy Airport. It was known as Idlewild then, and it was a fairly small airport. They didn't have these loading chutes and all that. You had to go up the steps and. <clears throat> Baba's uh, left leg was in a cast, you know, and we had to handle him very carefully. And um, we used the wheelchair a great deal, and we wheeled him out onto the tar tarmac with, uh, in the wheelchair, and someone brought a straight, plain straight chair, uh, and uh, we transferred Baba to the straight chair. And, uh, well, to see, there was Mayor G, Saroche, Dr. Nilu, uh, let's see who else, um, hmm. Adi and myself, and we carried him up the steps and into the little vestibule of the plane and put the chair down. And uh, then we contemplated that narrow aisle going down <laughs> through the plane. It was very narrow. And uh, how to get Baba down through that aisle. And uh, so finally, it, it, it just dawned on me that I had seen in the hospital recently, I had seen a doctor pick Baba up bodily and carry him over to a table to put him there to examine his leg and his arm. Let's see which arm was it this time? And uh, his nose and all of that. <clears throat> and I thought, well, gee, that'd be the best way. And uh, <clears throat> Baba was like a child. He let us do whatever we wanted to do. So believe it or not, and I, I did, you know, it's kind of crazy, wasn't it? I reached down, I actually picked Baba up. You know, he was like, he put his arm around my shoulder. But then I realized as I started lifting him up, I can't do this, here's Baba's mandali, you know? And who am I to be picking Baba up and he carried him down through the aisle? So I, <laughs> so I put him back down. <laughs> Bob was just as calm and placid as a little child. And then we kind of stood around and, you know, looked at it again, you know. Then uh, we didn't talk. We just all together decided, well, we guess we'd carry him in the chair. So each of the four Mondley members managed to get a hold of a leg of the chair each. And I found myself on the right side of the chair. We had to lift it up above the tops of the seats in order to get through. So... We didn't have any, for, I didn't have any forethought of how I was going to get through there. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm holding it up like that. And my position, I, it was a an irreversible position because Baba reached down and took a hold of my shirt and he was holding it like this. <laughs> so I couldn't just let go when we came to the row of seats. So we're going along, we come to this whole row of seats. You know, I'm kind of startled. What am I doing now? It wasn't anything to do but step over the first seat <laughs> and into the seat part itself. And from that seat into the seat of the next one, all the way down through the plane. And Baba's holding me like this, you know, the shoulder, you know, <laughs> just as calm as can be. <laughs> and meantime, there was a young fellow, a steward in the front. He was aghast at what I was doing, you know, going through those seats like that. <laughs> but we made, I, at the time, it didn't seem funny. It seemed kind of hairy, you know. <laughs> but Bob was completely composed and undisturbed. And finally, we got him there. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, the monthly members took the chair, and we got Baba seated across three seats in the front part of the plane. And I was uh, left alone with Baba, which was really nice. A few precious moments. We just he just looked loving, lovingly at me, and uh, a last embrace. And uh, but that was one of the funny stories. Um, then when you told it at a meeting, 
<coughs> at our house. Jeff Wolverton was there and his friend Ken, and they laughed so hard that jumped up on the couch and jumped like monkeys. <laughs> 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 that oh, that's why I said, what, what, what was it that amused you that much? And him stepping over the seats or what? He says, no. He says he had God in his hand and he pulled him down. <laughs> well, my topic <laughs> was given to me to my life with Baba, and uh, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> And I was going to say what uh, Charles said, someone else said, I haven't got anything to say, and then found myself talking all <laughs> for hours. <laughs> anyway, my life with Baba, I had to think it over last night and I couldn't sleep for three hours. <laughs> if I had a computer, a tape recorder, I would give you the tape and, and sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, the, I went to the beginning. My life was a series of awakening, and the first awakening was uh, in 1933. I met him in spirit, and do you know I never thought about meeting him in spirit when Darwin used to speak about meeting Baba in spirit in 32, and uh, it was years later that it dawned on me. Hey, you, I met Bob in the spirit in 33, <laughs> before I met him in the physical. Uh, we often went to see Marina in New York. When she came back from India, we'd come and sit around her feet, and she'd be telling us all about Bob. I got us so enthused and crying <laughs> and everything. And I, yeah. Uh, uh, and then from, uh, we spent the one, one Sunday excursion during the last, and during those days, believe it or not, they had, uh, no, I didn't take an excursion train, <laughs> we went by car, didn't we? Well, but we often did. Go yeah, well, two dollars round trip, can you imagine that? <laughs> so we could go to New York often on Sundays. Anyway, this time we went there, and from there we were on our way home, and it took us about five hours, so a friend of ours suggested we stop at Red Hook, but before we went, we uh, they asked us to go to Stokes Home. You've heard about the Stokes Home, uh, about that room upstairs, and they uh, wondered if we would uh, like to go up there. Josephine Ross was Joseph Anton at the time. Her mother was a uh, a writer, and, and uh, first heard of that name. And so I said, of course, I want to go to the meditation room. And I went there, and as Darwin said before, it was such a beautiful uh, room, so full of vibrations, and it, it's such a holy room, I'd call it. It's just like going into a church and better, with all the beautiful pictures of uh, holy men, and, and this portrait that is now in Baba's house in Myrtle Beach, the beautiful portrait in the living room. And that was over the mantelpiece there, and as I looked at the, his uh, photo, uh, portrait, I felt like I get choked up. <laughs> he, uh, I felt like I was embraced, and I, I didn't think uh, uh, anything of it. I didn't think in those days that you know I, one could be embraced by spirit, in spirit. But I broke down, and cried, cried, and cried, and cried, and so on our way home, we stopped at Red Hook. It was uh, Josephine's mother was staying there, and she said, "You can use our cottage and rest up there." And uh, there was no one there in the house, and it was just a simple cottage. So we were so imbued with the Baba's spirit and love. Then we wanted to write a letter to Baba. So I went out into the garden thinking that Baba would be more there than in the house, or <laughs> something like that. And I, I was sitting there with such a beautiful garden, and I couldn't get past the salutation. How do you address somebody like Baba? His Holiness, His Majesty, His 
God, oh God knows what that is. I didn't know. It. Couldn't get past. I just couldn't get any further with that letter. I said, I'll go in and ask Darwin. He, he'll give me a clue. Of, how do you address Baba? I couldn't, wouldn't think of saying, dear Baba, right off. You know, I had to give him a title or something. So I went in and I, as I stepped into the room, I couldn't go do anything more but just be awed by the the presence that was there. And Darwin was sitting at the desk and I tiptoed quietly. I was uh, just filled with it. And uh, I sat down quietly and I just you know, waited for Darwin to look up and, and I started to go like this. And Darwin <laughs> heard me and saw me and he went like that. So he was smelling the same thing I was smelling. I thought somebody was around burning incense, and it was so fragrant with sort of a touch of incense. And it lasted quite a while, and we just sat there and just was completely taken up into the spirit with that beautiful perfume. And I never heard of anything like that, and I didn't know what that was to, yeah, I think, someone or Narina, or maybe I read uh, <coughs> that the pre about, uh, a master announces <coughs> his presence that way. So I was very happy about that, but still I, I, I wondered, you know, what it was. And then years later, uh, not too many years later, but when we used to sing in arena, uh, and this was uh, one summer, she uh, and Elizabeth invited us to the family, I mean the girls and I, just the uh, women, uh, were invited, a few women invited to stay at a camp on a lake in Connecticut. We <laughs> had a, a lovely weekend there. And Norina, as you know, uh, would be in that, uh, what they called, thought transmission? Yes. Uh, that was Baba speaking through her. And sometimes I was skeptical of it, you know, <laughs> whether it was really Baba. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there were times when I uh, felt that it, it was Baba because I felt it. But this, so, Narina said she would answer, or Baba would answer the questions through her. If anyone had any questions, they could write them out and slip it under the door, and then the next day she would give us an appointment. So, uh, so I did, and another lady, Olive Winfield, she has passed on, and. Uh, I thought I'd th think up a good one, you know. Baba's going to answer that. <laughs> I'm going to um, make it real tough. I said, why did Jesus say, oh, God, why hast thou forsaken me when he was on the cross? I never heard the answer from anywhere, so I thought, well, I'll go right to headquarters <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then the other one was about love. What did Baba mean when he said, through love, I heard you will sit see me as I really am. I said, I saw him as he really was, uh, you know. No, this was, it was after I saw him. <laughs> but uh, Baba said that in 34, didn't he? Yeah. Well, then I didn't ask that question, except that it was on love. I want to know all about love, <laughs> and uh, from Baba's point of view. And uh, so she invited us the next day to come and sit uh, with her. She sat cross-legged and dressed in white on the edge of the bed. There was no posters. And Olive it was also asked to come in, the two of us, and we sat there on the rug beside her. And she, uh, the first question was not even mentioned at all. <laughs> and even Baba couldn't answer it. <laughs> <coughs> so, Arena launched onto this subject of love. It was the most beautiful talk that I ever heard on love. And as I sat there through, halfway through, I began to have the same fragrance, and it was coming right out of her mouth. And I said, how could she put anything in her mouth? And, and you know, after a half an hour or so, and have it still there, and, and you know, and be so powerful, and it was just filling the whole room. And I said, yeah, it is Baba, isn't it? <laughs> Because by that time I heard that, that Baba did announce his presence that way. 
So then I, uh, I was converted, so to speak, <laughs> to believe that it was Baba coming through her, and I had some wonderful experiences listening to what Baba had to say through her when she used to give talks in her the, the apartment that she and Elizabeth had in New York. It was very good. One time, when she had such a large crowd as this, in this big living room, and I, I was weeping, and she had me come and sit by her, and I was so embarrassed because I was crying so much. I said, what's she doing that for? I don't want to sit up there. <laughs> but, the, but I even got worse when she had me sit there. I was just bawling my head off. But Baba was coming through so often that way, and I had so many dreams the first few years, uh, and after meeting Baba in 34, I had significant dreams but okay. I, of Baba, and I thought that it would be indelibly marked in my mind, but the mind is tricky, and as you get older, uh, and you really don't remember, so I tell all the young people, please write it down when you have a dream of Baba or a wonderful experience. Don't trust it to your memory because uh, you, just when the time comes when you want to share it, you won't remember everything. And uh, it is true, I, I can't remember many of my dreams, but uh, Baba uh, came t to me once in a dream as Jesus, and then uh, he was, uh, was not keeping silence uh, uh, then, you know, and I heard him laugh, and it was the most musical laugh you ever heard. And, and then, for some reason or other, uh, in the, I was dressed in black in this tree, like the way the women in uh, Jerusalem, you know, in the foreign countries, with the black uh, veils, you know, that, that's how I was dressed. And uh, it was uh, Jesus that was supposed to have said these words. Instead, I was saying them at the uh, ex entrance of the tent. We were on the outskirts of Jerusalem, and and I was looking out, and I was saying the words that Jesus said, unless Baba put the words in my mouth, uh, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would take you to my bosom if, if you would have it. Do you remember, any of you remember that quotation? Like a mother hen. Like a mother hen. <laughs> when I told it to Ella Winterfeld, she used to call me, oh, here's mother hen here coming. <laughs> <laughs> and then, there, were, there was another figure, and then I saw another figure, and Baba seemed to kind of vanish. And uh, this face was the most beautiful face you could imagine. And it, it had a beard and a mustache, but the face was beautifully chiseled, and very beautiful face. And um, I heard a voice say, you are looking into the eyes of God. And, and as, as the words were said, I, I felt Baba so strong in his love. And then the eyes, the face disappeared gradually, and, uh, and then there was uh, uh, symbol, uh, symbolic things given to me so I'd know uh, who that was. And it was like a bulb, and behind the bulb were these eyes only, the rest of the face vanished. And uh, in those days, the bulb was called Basta. And of course, immediately uh, it came to me the word Ahura Mazda, because uh, I had read some literature. Ahura Mazda, and that was a Persian name for God, Zoroaster, name for God. So I thought, I wonder if that was a Zoroaster, because I never saw a picture of him, so I didn't know what he looked like. But years later, I came across a book, I think that. Uh, the Sufis had or something, and um, there was a picture of Zoroaster, and that's just the way he looked. He, he had the headdress, you know, this way and that way, and it was just like the, pic, uh, the image that was in the tree outside of Mara's window. And that's how, you know, Baba looked, like Zoroaster in, in that tree image. And this time, in this picture, this way, Zoroaster looked, and so I did see Baba as a Zoroaster, and uh, that made me pleased, but the dreams have faded away. Baba had even given me lectures, and I mean, speeches. 
Oh yes, when I was, that was an early uh, dream where Baba was talking to me, and I said, Baba, you're talking. Have you broken your silence? And he says, only to you this time. <laughs> <laughs> so I never worried about Bob breaking silence. He already did <laughs> with me. So anyway, I'll pause for some breath. You want me to tell a funny story? I'll tell you another funny story that happened with Baba. This was in 1952 in New York City. <clears throat> Uh, I had driven Baba in to the city in Fred Winterfell's old Chevrolet. Some of you may have been familiar with that. It was a two-door, and uh, it was especially uh, useful because the doors were so wide, Baba could get through to the back seat pretty well with his one leg in a cast, you know. And uh, I was taking him to the apartment of Consuelo Cides, who had a penthouse apartment at the corner of 3rd Avenue and 60, East 68th Street. And uh, Keith McGaffey, uh, Phyllis's nephew, a young fellow, 16 years old, and uh, Dr. Gohar were with me, with Baba and me. And uh, we had Baba's uh, wheelchair in the trunk of the car. <clears throat> Everything went fine. Uh, until we got to the uh, East uh, 68th Street, and I, and I pulled up to the curb in front of the apartment uh, house, and um, Keith McGaffey and uh, Dr. Gowar went out and got the wheelchair and came around to the street side with it, opened it up. And meantime, I climbed into the back seat and helped Baba to get up on his, his right foot. He could kind of hop around on his right foot. Well, my car was a, just a regular sedan, and the front seat was just a solid seat. You could lean on it, and nothing would happen. But, you know, a two-door, the, the front seats fold, and I wasn't used to that. And uh, so what developed uh, hinged on that folding seat. <laughs> so I got him back of Baba and, and put my hands under his armpit and helped him toward the door, and he kind of hopped. And uh, meantime, I'm sort of leaning on the seat in back of the steering wheel. And uh, Baba had just started his descent, and everything happened all at once. I, I leaned over a little bit too far, kind of lost my balance. The seat went over, <laughs> hit the horn, the horn started to blow, <laughs> kept on blowing. People stopped on the street, everybody stopped to look what's happening. And I'm beginning to sweat, you know. And holding Baba, and I, you know, I do, doing, oh, it looked like a disaster might happen. And, and uh, he'd already started to go down to the street, and all to do now. The only thing I could do was to stick out my left leg, and Baba slid down my leg. <laughs> 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 and landed on his right foot, and straightened up, and then go on. And Keith helped him. He kind of hopped around and kind of looked at me with his <laughs> <smile. laughs> But it was kind of scary for a few seconds there, you know. <laughs> well, that gives me a clue uh, from the, uh, about something uh, at that time when you were in Scarsdale. Yes. Well, after Baba had been uh, at, uh, giving interviews at Mrs. Deuce's apartment, uh, I won't go into that, it's too long, and um, I... I didn't get to say goodbye to Baba. I felt sad. And I, after the doings the last day, I went upstairs and I didn't get down. The stairway was packed with people and they were wheeling Baba out. And, and, and I, my heart was going out to Baba and I just felt so sad that I didn't get an embrace. And Baba just looked up and he went like this as, and as if to say, don't worry. And of course, Baba, always tries to make up, he makes up to you if you very deeply feel you miss something. And I felt that I'll never get over missing saying goodbye to Mama, because we had to go back uh, home. So we were back home, and uh, I longed to be in New York, so at least close to, uh, to Darwin. So when Darwin came back from Scarsdale, and he was staying over at Winterfeld's, 
that some of that nice vibes would rub off on me. <laughs> and I was with Bob every day there, and and uh, that's why she thought maybe some of Bob's vibes would rub off on. So I, I wrote a letter to Darwin, of course. In those days, uh, the post office was was much better. Anyway. <laughs> And he got the letter and he took it in with him that morning when he went to Baba and uh, he said, told about me wanting to come and how I longed to see him and that, and I was, and I wanted to come and Baba said, you mean here? And I said, no, she wants to come to Winterfels and, and be there when I, when I come back and before she goes back. And that was the weekend that when I did go on the train and two dollars round trip. And uh, I was came to the winter house, and we were Ella. I replied. Oh yes. Yeah. Not only can you come, but you've got a surprise. Baba will be there. Baba will be there. Well, you could just imagine. I wanted to push the train or something to get here fast <laughs> enough. And so when I arrived uh, uh, there, um, see, Baba was making up to me. I didn't realize that he would. Uh, his graciousness. Uh, and filled the bill. Anyway, and we, uh, when I came there, the Phyllis and Adele were there, and uh, I don't think anyone else besides and the, the, ladies. the ladies were to come with Baba, and they hadn't arrived yet. And uh, Ella came to me and she said, Dean, will you tell me what I should do with the fruit that I have on the dining room table? Baba said, Nothing but tea, just tea. And Baba was having the girl, ladies come to see the TV because they never saw the t a TV, you know. So when Ella asked me about the fruit on the table, and she said, because she wanted to strictly obey Baba, and she said, I said, no, don't take it off. And people have decorations like that on the table in the dining room, fruit, you know, as a centerpiece. And then I said, well, you can draw the curtain as if Baba can see through the curtain. And he says, he won't even look up that way, and so on. And so she said, okay, and so she did. And, and Baba did arrive and with the ladies, and the men had to stay in the lobby of the hotel. It was all for ladies. And so we sat down, and the TV was turned down, and there was baseball. And, oh, I don't care for baseball. So I said, oh, I gotta sit through this baseball thing. And Baba right away had it turned off. And there was a nice soap opera. I said, that's better. And I got interested. And as soon as I got interested, back to baseball. And I had to, <laughs> and I had to just sit through the baseball for a while. And, I, I, and, and well, Baba didn't uh, stay too long with the TV. So then he said, uh, let's have tea. So Ella served the tea, and after the tea, Bob says, and he sent, he, he drank out of his cup, of, and he sent it to Darwin and Fred to have the rest of the tea. It was nice prasad. He didn't forget them there. So then uh, Bob says, bring on the fruit. <laughs> he, he didn't even look up that way. He was uh, on the couch with his feet up like that, and everybody was around him, and I remember that Phyllis got right right next to him uh, by the couch, and uh, Baba was throwing the fruit around, really throwing it uh, when you didn't expect it and you had to really catch it. <laughs> and everyone had piece of fruit, and I wasn't getting any. And I said, that serves me right. I said, I shouldn't have put my two cents in about the fruit. And then here comes a fruit flying at me, you know, and I just <laughs> caught it, you know. And I really think it must have been an airport because there weren't any fruit left. There wasn't any fruit left. And um, I looked at it, and it looked like an apple with brown spots, like a rotten apple. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, serves me right. I get a rotten apple at that. <laughs> but I, I took it on the train to eat with me to eat it. But <clears throat> before I end that story, I, I want to tell a funny part of it. When Phyllis was sitting there, <coughs> and Baba was very mischievous chicken, <laughs> he went and took some grapes, and she had a low neck blouse, and he was dropping grapes down her blouse. <laughs> 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 
and she was going wiggly, you know. <laughs> and Baba got to just laugh at her. <laughs> and all the all the ladies too. Is she here too? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> that, never, that never made the awakener. No, that didn't make the awakener. <laughs> well, when how I told <laughs> then when I was eating the fruit. What happened to that fruit? Well, I was eating the fruit, and it was the sweetest most wonderful tasting fruit I ever had in my life and to this day I haven't located one anywhere and when I went to New York and looked at those uh, vendors uh, uh, fruit I was looking for it and I couldn't find anything like it it looked like a green gauge plum but it was big like an apple and it tasted a little bit like nectarine and uh, some other sweet uh, Indian fruit and Really, well, Baba just manufactured it, I think. <laughs> he had a way of doing that. In fact, Darwin had the experience of Baba doing that with a piece of candy when he was giving out his prasad. Shall I come? Yeah. This was the one day at Scarsdale in 1952. Um, I was in the room with Baba alone, and uh, he had some of these striped peppermint candies, and um, he gave me one. And uh, he had just one left. I, I could see it was all very clear. There was just one left. That's all there was. And he motioned me to go out, call Meherji. And uh, so I said, yes, Baba. And I went out looking for Meherji. Meherji was out on the lawn. And uh, then Fred Winterfeld had just arrived and was talking animatedly with Meherji. And uh, I didn't like to interrupt them or even to tell Mary that he should just come alone. So I didn't know what to do, but I just did interrupt after excusing myself and said, Baba wants you, Mary So not only Mary came in, but Fred Winterfeld too. And I, and I said, now what about, what's going to happen? I put Baba on the spot because uh, uh, Baba, when things like this would happen, Baba would kind of put a kind of a bland expression on his face, you know. And uh, he, he gave the, I know he only had one of these candies, he gave it to Meherji, then he kind of casually looked at me as much as to say, you think you're putting me on the spot, and then also gave another one to Fred Winterfeld. <laughs> <laughs> I know there was only the one there. Well, Bob is a great magician. He does know how to put his body together the right way. He's tall and he's thin, and he has a big head. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the way he looked to me in a car, and, and so that's just a joke. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, uh, since my title is Life with Baba, I um, throughout the uh, we we really, as Leitrus quoted, we that Baba said they live only for me, and it just after years and years, I realized we did do that because that was that's my life and we had a lot of hardship we didn't have it easy it was depression days you know what they were I think America is ashamed of it because they show all about the Holocaust but we never see a picture on TV about the depression days and the lines for bread <laughs> in this country jobs no jobs Darwin and didn't have a job, and, and you couldn't even buy one. And it was really very hard. And I had the three children, and then I was, it wasn't well, and uh, just uh, uh, we had to rely on Baba. I think that's that's what it was. We had to depend on him 100 percent because where else uh, could we go? What could we do? And Baba saw us through many many hard times, and. Uh, then things begin to pick up, and uh, and when, uh, of course, when we heard and during the war, it was very hard. And Bob always gave us these things that we had to do. Uh, and um, one time, Baba had us recite a um, a sentence. I don't even remember now. 
and a hundred times uh, twice a day or once a day? Well, we had several occasions when there were different things we had to but, recite. But I mean, about that sentence, twice oh. a day or? Well, it was a long, we had to do it all at one sitting, and we even had a bee, I had Darwin beans. had beans, I beans and I had beads. <laughs> I, I made a hundred beads go on the string, and, and, and we had to say it five times, didn't we? Five times round. Mm -hmm. and so it was 500 times we had to say it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, recite the, uh, and of, uh, of course things happen. Uh, my sisters came uh, to visit me, and of course they weren't for Baba, and they were right there in the living room, and I was uh, a surprise, visit. A surprise visit, and I was just uh, <laughs> in a room behind the curtain, and you're supposed to say it audibly, and. Uh, and Darwin didn't know what to say, where I was, and he just say, well, she's around, or I don't know, I haven't seen her. And, and so, and there I am, behind a curtain, mumbling, and they knew very well I was there, you know. <laughs> and, and they didn't want to have an issue of some kind, so they left. <laughs> but they probably didn't want, never asked me what it was all about. <laughs> so that was an embarrassing time. And uh, another time Baba had to say God's name, you could choose one of six. And uh, I went off by myself so I could be very private and quiet. And I think I chose the name God Almighty. And, you know, it kind of makes a round, God Almighty, Almighty, God, you know, it sounded that way. And I kept saying it. So many, I don't know how many times I was supposed to say it or for how long. I think it was timed. We had to say it, for, and, uh, and I wonder how we we're going to tell how long we were saying this. And uh, well, Baba knew when to make a stop, because as I was saying this name over and over and over, I, I went to a, a, a state of, uh, I don't know what to call it, but I, I know how to say bliss, but I felt, no, I felt joy. I, I mean, in, a definition in, uh, of joy that I could never, you know, find. It was such joy that, that my mind came into the picture say, oh, joy is God. That was, that's what it was. It was, you know, people talk about love and, and so on, but they don't talk about joy. But this joy was so exquisite and so um, uh, penetrating and so wonderful that it was similar to I, what I would imagine bliss would be, but because my mind entered in, it left me. But <laughs> I wish I had been able to stay in that state, uh, and it wasn't brought on, but you know, you know it was brought. It was Baba wanting us to concentrate so much on on what we, what the name was, that it brought about this uh, rapturous feeling. But so I always think of joy. Uh, is uh, more than love, and uh, then uh, uh, I can't think of the, uh, the other uh, things that we had to uh, say. And then uh, we had a nice break in 1948 when we had to, uh, it was the most wonderful break, the most wonderful uh, for me because it was shortly after surgery I had was recovering, and uh, we went to live in Myrtle Beach in Yupon Dunes, 48 of fall, uh, 48 to 49. And of course, uh, Darwin had to be given something to do. <laughs> he was uh, supervisor of the drainage ditch and looking after the center. And uh, I, I like to think that it was my bonus from Baba, and Baba had to invent something. <laughs> for us to go to Myrtle Beach to live. He was living from, you know, poverty to luxury. It, it was such a wonderful break for me. I didn't have to get lunch. I didn't have to do anything. I could go swimming, and, and, and it was such a nice rest. There wasn't even an elevator there. And if I couldn't go up the stairs, I took the elevator. I mean, I was young, but I was just recovering from the uh, surgery. And the children went to school, and Darren went to the center all day, and then he would come home. And uh, on Sundays or on weekends we'd go, and we'd cook. I'd cook a meal, and we would have such a nice time at the center. That was before anybody 
uh, it was uh, staying there, and our children first realized, and I shouldn't say first, but they, they got so in, involved in knowing more about Baba, like Beatrice spoke about reading Baba books and that Elizabeth had there, and, and because uh, uh, of the, uh, the beautiful feeling that would come always uh, there when Baba was uh, writing, uh, having uh, Elizabeth write letters to Darwin, it was a constant exchange of letters, and uh, with it always was uh, love from Baba, and it was such a, a whole year of a holiday. It was, I really recuperated nicely. It was so, I was so thankful and grateful to have had that break. And then we only had to wait until 52 when Baba was coming. And 52 stands out to me as a highlight of, uh, even after the other t the years with Baba, because uh, Baba just um, stepped up things so much that I found uh, that I was experiencing intuition so much more than reason, and that I w was able to uh, function on that level. Uh, I knew things without knowing, you know, there was a knowingness in that love, you know, of course this was after I met Bob over there, and, uh, and we, Bob uh, just um, seemed to awaken me to that uh, feeling. I had a very good uh, um, intuitive sense about things, and I didn't care about the world at all. And we, when uh, we thought of uh, when we were in Myrtle Beach, we used to ooh now nah about the wonderful uh, scenery in the center and, and the ocean. But this time, it, uh, nothing was as beautiful as thinking about Baba. So I was, we were just thinking and loving Baba all the time, and and. Uh, we had so much of Baba at the center. Oh, yes, that would illustrate perhaps uh, one way of uh, intuitive knowing. Um, uh, when uh, our friend Frank Keaton had been a caretaker, and then he, uh, when Darwin was there for that year, he got a job at the school, and he was teaching music, and our daughter learned how to play the flute. He taught her how to play the flute that, during that time. and. Uh, uh, Frank uh, little, had a little boy that was just about two years old, maybe not quite two years, because, uh, uh, and he, uh, he told him all about Baba. He talked to the baby from the time the baby uh, could say <laughs> Baba, <laughs> as babies do. And uh, so when uh, he talked to him about Baba coming, uh, little Frank, he would say, Oh, I, I want to see Baba, I want to see Baba, even though he was so small. So when the time came for people to come to see... Frank's wife wasn't in favor. Yeah, Frank's wife was not in favor of uh, Baba. So when the time came uh, for Baba uh, to have interviews and things, Frank wanted to bring little Frankie. And he spoke to his wife about it, and she said, No, no way we're going to take him. So Frank was very, very upset and worried. So that evening he, oh, he he came to Darwin and and said, "Can you speak to Baba about what shall I do? Should I bring him anyway? Defy you know, and what shall I do?" And so Darwin approached Baba and told him. And, you know. well, Baba said, "Never mind. I will see him from here." And when Baba said that, I could almost see Frankie from there because Baba was really seeing him. You know, if you see that. Exactly. So that evening, uh, when we saw Frank, he came to me and said, what do you think, Jane? Do you think I should just uh, de defy her and, and take him anyway? I have the right. And I thought a moment, and, and I said, no. I didn't have any reason to say no, but I said, no. And then I said, uh, just get up in the morning and say nothing. And, uh, and then after a pause, you know, I said, uh, and I, I wasn't given to such, you know, predictions or what have you, but my intuition was working good during that time. So um, I said, but he's, Baba's going to see him. He says, how do you know? I don't know how I know, but Baba will see little Frankie. Well, I'll take, I'll go on that, you know, hopefully. And so 
Yeah, uh, that morning when. Oh, yes. Uh, you probably wonder about this part of the story. I was stationed at the barn at the back porch for a day of interviews for everyone, and I had orchestra seat there all by myself. Bob would put me there. You had a duty there. A duty to keep people off the porch, and then if anyone was dazed <laughs> with tears and with tears, so they wouldn't know where to turn, they might go off to the wrong side and fall into the lake. <laughs> or I would have to direct them, and if they didn't eat the prasad, I, and looking dazed, I said, you're supposed to eat it and explain it to them. And of course, I saw what was going on, and, and, uh, and as I stood there, my, my mouth opened wide and said, oh, and my eyes, I said, look at Frankie's coming. And what, what did Baba do? Before Frank and Frankie came, he turned to me and went, <laughs> to me, as if to say, see? Frank was taking, bringing his little boy. Yeah, Frank. he was bringing his little boy in there, and he verified, Baba verified what I had to say, so of course my faith grew stronger to that, and reliance on, on intuition more than reason. And I later said to Frank, well, how did you manage it? How did it come about? I know Baba had some hand in it, but what did he do or what? And he says, well, he said, I got up early and I was all set to go out the door. And of course, uh, my wife wouldn't have me take him. And, and Frankie woke up all by himself. He said, Daddy, where are you going? Are you going to see Baba? I'm going, wait for me, wait for me. And uh, no, you, you can't go. Mommy says you can't go. Oh, I am going, he says. I'm going. And he was, you know, just a little fella. And I said, yes, but what happened? He says, he screamed the house down. And she said, take him, take him. <laughs> and, and Frankie could do it, too. And he didn't get his way. <laughs> I know how that would sound. I would say the same thing. Thank you. And so Frank brought him to Baba, and Baba put his arms out to Frankie and gave him a big embrace, and I saw him do that. And then Frankie has always been in Baba's love, and when he was graduating, he gave a talk on Baba at high school. He was a valedictorian. So that's just an illustration of intuition. Oh. Uh, in 52, before Baba came to the barn for this big interview. Of course, before that day of interview, we, we were all there at the center, and we, but we didn't stay there. No one stayed there except the ones who were helping to take care of Narina and, this, and helping with uh, and the ladies. The ladies were at the guest house. And so we stayed in an apartment near where Frank lived. We only paid $25 a week for the whole family stay there. Imagine that, how prices were then. And we used to uh, come in for, for appointments, and uh, other people stayed at the Hotel Lafayette that is no longer there. And when people came from a long journey to different places, and they looked tired and they didn't know what was what and what the you know, schedules were, we found ourselves to be like a receiving committee at the hotel without any words and instructions or anything. We got up early. We just wanted uh, to be <coughs> sure that if the appointment was early that we were there at the hotel. But Baba had us serve as a uh, host, so to speak. Uh, Baba was so subtle, you know. So he doesn't have to give you an order if he wants to give it to you via intuition in the heart. So uh, we came there and we greeted the people and we assured them how things would be. and and what they should do, what was the program. And we just waited for our appointment, and our appointment was on May the 10th, and we were, that was the most wonderful Mother's Day that year. <laughs> for me, it was Mother's Day. And the family, the Shaw family that went there, and there were other days, every day we just about we were asked to come to the center. <clears throat> and then on the 17th, anyone could come. So, uh, uh, before uh, the people came, uh, the, everything was readied, and there were chairs on, on the front side of the barn for people to sit and wait for their appointment. There was um, a table of books, and, and Delia and Margaret were uh, receiving the committee at the door. 
and I was at the back door. And the way that happened, I, I got there real uh, early, and uh, I wonder which comes first. <laughs> anyway, before anyone came there, I saw Elizabeth there. And uh, the sand had been swept clean, you know, just like a marble table. And, and, and the, it wasn't good enough for Elizabeth. She saw one little uh, twig, uh, you know, or pine needle that was marring the surface. So she was going to sweep it, but she gave me the broom when I came along. Uh, and, um, and I said, my goodness, people are going to come and trample it. Nobody's going to look at the sand. All they're going to think about is going to bother, you know. It didn't just, I said, oh, well, it won't hurt me. Uh, so I made a motion to, with the broom to, you know, to sweep. And just then, Bob was coming with the group behind him, and Bob was walking so fast, but he separated himself from the people and come towards me. First, first you had the thought. Oh, well, yeah, but I saw Bob coming, you see, while I had the broom. And he separated himself, was coming towards me. And when I had this broom, and the worst thoughts came through my head. Bob probably wanted to wipe him out. I had to come out first, you know. And so I said, oh my goodness, in India, only the untouchables are sweepers, you know. And I said, oh, I'm caught, you know, I, you know, here I am with a broom. And I didn't dare throw it down. That when Baba already saw me, and I felt, you know, uh, I'll just hold it. And Baba come right to me, and he got my thoughts all right, and he took the broom from me, and he started doing this, you know. And and the thought came to my head, Erich wasn't there to interpret, and maybe I had two uh, interpretations, one at that time, then another one much later. And it was, uh, if the highest of the high can sweep, <laughs> I came to, you know, that was the thought I got in my head, <laughs> and I felt very humble. <laughs> but later on, Baba had a quotation by Baba, was that, uh, I am the broom, he says, and I, should, I have come to sweep, clean the, all these sand scarers and, and the world's, you know, sins and things like that. So I don't know which one to accept, or both, you know. So, I mean, yeah, I'll just accept both of them. So, uh, yeah, story about Mrs. Clark. Oh, no, I think gardenias didn't come into the picture then, although they were blooming at the center around the guest house, and it was very nice for the ladies to uh, to have the gardenias, and uh, it was a wonderful time for the ladies to be there, and I had a chance to see them several times, and Baba would give us, give me a break from duty on the porch, and he said, now you and your daughters can go see Mara and the ladies. And so that was a nice, happy time with them. And at that time, uh, Mara and Mani were the only ones that were uh, seeing us, and the others were summers there in the house. And, and Mara and Mani took us in their room and had the lovely scarves spread out on the bed and said, Baba wants you to have one of these, so we choose one. So we each got a beautiful silk scarf, and I lost mine already, <laughs> sadly to say. And, and we had such a wonderful time with Mara and Mani. It was the first time I saw Mara, and I can't describe her beauty at that time. She had beautiful pale green sari, and her hair was pulled back, and and she had the most heavenly look on her face, and so loving, and Amani too, that, that she, we just uh, were so happy with them. It was such a wonderful time with them. Yeah, but that's the biggest story. <laughs> I won't go into that. Uh, so, uh, and then I'd go back to, to my duty on the porch there, and I saw some wonderful things, and and some people would try to come and, and I think during our absence, Phyllis and it, it took charge, or uh, Dell, I don't recall now. And uh, you know, while I was standing there, I was feeling the vibrations coming from the room all the time with all these uh, interviews, and I couldn't hear everything, but I was beginning to vibrate so hard that it was like holding on to some kind of a circuit and and you, you can't let go, you know, and it was 
and I just thought I was going to explode. And uh, I had this feeling of I was like I was holding on to something that was making me vibrate. I couldn't take in anymore. I became conscious of what was happening, and I let go. I wondered often what would happen if I if I didn't let go. But I guess Baba thought, well, you had enough. Let go. <laughs> so I don't know what uh, what a, you know what purpose that was, but. You couldn't help anybody would feel that way. It's very beautiful a vibration, happy vibration. You know, it was. It's hard for me to describe the wonder that it is, and it was quite different from other love experiences. There, I think I'll pause here if you want to say anything. Oh, all right. Um, <laughs> I think. Um a funny story or something. Um, well, a, a little story. This happened in Myrtle Beach in 1958. <laughs> Baba wanted to go to the beach. No, 50. No, that was, yeah, it was 58. Baba, Baba always went to the beach whenever he was at the center. And in 1958, this was after the second accident. And uh, his hip was giving him a lot of pain. And so Dr. Harry Kenmore had rigged up a, a carrying chair for Baba. <clears throat> it, and uh, along this, it was a comfortable chair, and long rods or rails had been placed along each side so that four or five or even more could get along the sides and carry it, you know, wherever Baba wanted to go. <clears throat> and uh, mostly the uh, young, the male dancers were doing this because they were very strong and it was easy for them and it also gave them a chance to be very close to Baba. Baba would reach over and put his hands on them, you know. And uh, on this occasion of going to the beach, Baba was driven down as near as possible in the car and the carrying chair was brought along. <clears throat> and then Baba got out of the car and was put in the carrying chair and they carried him around and over the dunes. and. There were perhaps a couple of hundred of us following along. <clears throat> and of course, we all had our shoes and stockings on and so on. And as we got to the beach, Baba motioned, go toward the water. And <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, I got that frog. What are you doing? Yeah, I'm going to you. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I shouldn't have stayed in the swamp so long last night. <clears throat> So, uh, going out toward the water, sometimes there would be little pools of water that we'd have to wade through, and, it, and uh, Jean got, did that too, and they had discovered that her shoes and stockings didn't even get wet. But uh, I ran so far. <clears throat> when we finally got to the, to the water's edge, you know, we expected Baba would stop, you know, but he didn't. He said, kept motioning. And here we are right at the water's edge, and there was a split second when I think everyone wondered, well, what's, what's, what's Baba going to do? I took my shoes off and I pulled up my <laughs> dress and here I'm going right with but Baba if he in, wants us to drown. In that split yeah. second, I think we all thought, well, if you, <laughs> wherever Baba goes, we're going. And we, so with great joy, with clothes and all, we started we were wading into the ocean with <laughs> <laughs> the men right up to their knees, the, yeah. more, the men that were we, Of course, we didn't know it, that it happened so fast. We didn't have, know that he was going to stop, yeah. you know, that quickly. But uh, he wanted to go in just far enough so that he could put his feet he in did. the water. He could touch the water from the chair. <laughs> now, it was very significant. <laughs> but he also wanted to know what we were thinking. Would we go that was That's way? right. It was a little test. And so we, we made that. Uh, Leatrice has a nice little story that goes with that, too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Before she left for the beach, she felt impelled to do something. Do you want to tell about it from there? The day before, when I was at Baba's house, Baba said, tomorrow we might do this or that, and we might go to the beach. So I thought, well, we'll probably go to the beach. And I wore a sun back dress with a little jacket. So when we got to the beach, I took the jacket off and my shoes. And also, back at Baba's house, Baba said, it's very important to be physically as close to me as possible. And I felt that he meant me. And I said, now's my chance. I'm going to stick to Baba like glue. 
and I'm going to muscle my way through to be close to Baba tomorrow. So when we were on the beach, I was at Baba's shoulder as we crossed the beach. And I was right next to him as we went into the water. And I was so concentrated on being close to Baba that it, it never occurred to me that it was a test of how far into the ocean we would go. I was just being with Baba all the way, and it didn't matter if we went over our heads or anything. Nothing went in my mind. I was just, it was a feeling of rush as we entered the water. We just kind of rushed into the water.